<laughs> okay, so um, welcome to Open Eye Gallery, everybody. Um, my name is Liz Viviora, and I'm the creative producer here at Open Eye. And I've been specifically working for the past 12 months on a project called Culture Shifts, uh, which you're going to hear a lot more about through today's session. Um, Culture Shifts, just to give a bit of context, is oh, I should probably warn you, I'm losing my voice, so you have to bear with me when I go quiet and loud. <coughs> Um, but Culture has been very popular, which is partly to do with why I'm losing my voice for doing a lot of tours. Um, but the project's been going for the past 12 months, and it's a socially engaged photography programme that's involved Open Eye Gallery working with 11 photographers, of which Gary and Rob are two of them, um, based across the UK, working with city centre regional um, partners across all of the Liverpool city regions in Merseyside. And the idea of the programme was to not only invite photographers to come to these communities and document the people and places around them, Sorry. that's alright, um, but moreover to um, invite the communities and photographers to create work together about what it means to be people and places from that area and actually what it means for those communities um, to self-represent within the context of working with photography as a medium. Now all of the projects were completely different and I hope you've all had the chance to have a look around um, and see the different works. Um, and for me it's been one of the pleasures of working on the project actually, is to see that diversity of practice between the way not only each photographer approached the invitation to collaborate with a community partner, but actually the way the communities themselves responded to that invitation. Um, and the As and When project um, is a really good example of, of kind of how different communities do or do not want to engage and in what ways they want to work with photography as a medium that Gary and Rob will talk through in more detail. Um, but I'm going to let Gary and Rob introduce themselves and talk um, a bit of an overview about why they got involved with the project, why they're interested in this type of practice and commission. Um, and then we're going to go into a bit of a Q&A um, on some questions and then open out to the room, if that's alright with everybody. Okay. Hello everybody, I'll start I suppose. Um, if you can't hear me at any point, just raise your hand and I'll talk a bit louder. But um, I'm a senior lecturer at UCLan. I did a, I'm not a photographer by practice or training. I did a degree in film, degree in anthropology and then one in visual culture. So I'm interested in the visual, I'm also interested in well-being, I'm interested in community and how different people engage with different visual uh, processes. So, uh, and I know Robert as a friend before a collaborator, no, yeah. on a personal level before. Yeah, it was, wasn't it, actually? Mm -hmm. We meet DJing, I think. Yeah, yeah, we DJ together yeah. as well. So we collect records. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, I'm Robert Parkinson. I started. I guess my background is BA Fine Art. That's what I did at Preston, and then I got really frustrated with painting. Uh, so I started photographing what I wanted to paint. It's a lot easier to do. It felt like. Uh, and then started a project about on Preston, and then from there I've done the MA and. Uh, between me and me two years ago and now I've done about five or six socially engaged commissions from various institutes um, and yeah just kind of have similar interests to Gary uh, we've always kind of spoke about similar things and then this kind of cropped up mm -hmm. and we actually kind of both went for it simultaneously separately yep. and then it just kind of I was already meeting Sarah and it kind of crossed and it just made sense uh, to work together on this project really mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's about it from me, um, but I guess wh when we were starting with the project, as with all projects, you go in, you haven't a clue what you're going to do, you don't know who these people are, as much as research like you do, uh, you really don't know until you meet the people. Um, so we kind of went and met both groups, separate occasions really, didn't we? Yeah. Um yeah, when the ball got rolling and the project was proposed and we, it got okayed and we met Liz, we went, or I went out to see, because Robert wasn't available, to see the witness yeah. group, who we ended up working with, yeah. and the ladies from Windmill Hill, or a representation from their group, which I think was Chris, who had mm -hmm. some relationship with the group. Uh, I think he worked for the CCG, which is the Clinical Commissioning Group. And, and that was how the, how the project started, really. So it was off the basis of just meeting for the first time ever the groups who were proposed to work with us and that's yeah. how it was how it was formed really yeah and it was it was interesting because we 
we approached both with a similar viewpoint, didn't we? What mm -hmm. we kind of wanted to investigate with both groups. Um, but because we originally was like maybe four that they wanted us to work with. Yeah. So. Um, been stretched extremely. <laughs> Yeah, so our, our partners for the Halton project, which is the work that Gary and Rob did, which is the work behind us, which is why we're sat here, so you can see it at all times while we talk about it. Um, but the partner on that occasion within the local authority wasn't actually um, a cultural partner, but it was a health partner. Um, and particularly when looking at partnerships and socially engaged practice, um, we found actually that health partners are at the forefront of really understanding the impact that visual arts can have within health and well-being. And so actually it was really good to be able to work with Halton CCG, who funded it, but through that <coughs> had um, kind of targeted groups that they were very particularly keen to work with, who they felt would most benefit from the programme, or actually already championed in the area what it meant to be an active and healthy community group. Um, and so they were actually really keen, yeah, for you to work with four groups, mm -hmm. which I think would have made you not very ha yeah, healthy or well, which, actually, because that yeah, would have we been like, your life taken over. Yeah, the there's, there's no <laughs> way we can work with four, because, well, we, we could do, but it would never be in depth as much as we want it to be. With the it would have been of no value to the groups or yeah. to us, and I don't think anyone would have got anything beneficial from it, really, I think, given the time frame and the turnaround for the delivery, because there were, the exhibition dates were already set, once the mm -hmm. project had started, so you had a start date and you had an end date, uh, an end date, and you had to work within those parameters. So I think four groups would have been problematic. And the other thing I should mention is that when I wrote the application, and we decided to talk through what we wanted to do, we specifically asked to work with uh, well-being and health mm -hmm. out of the other seven groups and seven different formats or outcomes that could have been negotiated through the projects. We specifically asked for health and well-being. Yeah, and that was one of the um, main elements of the, of the commissioning part from Open Eye as well, is that we described the kind of um, general sense of community and focus for each of the local city regions. Um, and actually within that, um, usually our health partner or local authority partner kind of maybe had a target of their own um, for their own reason, because they work in that area, they know what their area needs. Um, so the photographers were always invited to um, put a preference of which community or area they felt most kind of that they could work with essentially that would get the best out of, of both the photographer and the community involved which is why you guys had kind of put put that focus on it yeah um, but maybe it's good to talk a little bit more about the two groups that you did work with and we do have some witness groups here you want to wait <laughs> sorry embarrassing. <laughs> um, which we may tease some questions out later he's looking at me now like this um, but the two groups are Witness Vikings Golden Generation Group and the Women of Windmill Hill, mm -hmm. who were both positioned on either side of the kind of iconic Runcorn Bridge that we all know. Which is just over there. Which is the picture there. <laughs> um, but one of the things I wanted to talk through was um, the different ways the community responded to your invitation to collaborate and the kind of approach that you kind of took on with them and how yeah. they how they kind of responded to yeah. that. I guess because we both got visual backgrounds, we were both quite interested in photography in this kind of area in the, uh, the, kind of the art world. We started with the kind of classic thing of giving everyone cameras and seeing what happens, because a lot of them had no kind of uh, background uh, using photography. So we thought we'd start with a base, a foundation, and everyone can kind of have a starting point with what we found visually interesting. So we gave everyone the, um, disposable cameras. Mm -hmm. Um, and <coughs> it was quite a hectic exercise in some sense because Women of Windmill Hill had a maximum of five members mm -hmm. at one point, whereas how many were the Vikings? Yeah, so I worked so with the Vikings. Between, between maybe 20? Yeah, I think top end there was 19 or 20. At its core there's maybe 13 to 15 ish yeah. um, members and they met regularly on a Friday afternoon. So even though me and Robert did the project together and uh, the kind of trajectory in which we worked was equal, you were kind of both set the same task at the same time, it was the two separate groups. Me and Robert very rarely worked actually in collaboration with one another. We did to begin with, I did a couple of sessions yeah. with the women of Windmill Hill, but, and it's just the nature of community work. 
you can only work when the community are available to work with you and you can't set expectations on when they should be free to the projects and equally if they don't want to do it that's also fine so and because I teach three days a week at UCLan amongst a few other bits and Robert's got his own stuff going on we worked out that uh, what worked best for the women in Windmill Hill was a Tuesday or a Wednesday? Yeah, initially we were just like gave everyone days, like when can you work and see if any crossed. Because we really wanted either to initially start working with the groups <coughs> separately, but we would have really liked the groups to be together and work in and see if, find like uh, relating themes between each other. Because that's what it was about really with the group, the, the area that we found could be quite interesting to do if there were these kind of themes that were linking the groups together. Why did these types of groups come together? What was their role? Why did they happen? Um, that was kind of our initial ideas. But again, because of like time constraints, mm -hmm. it was literally the only reason why we couldn't do it. it was almost yes, and people's routines as well. So the women of Women Hill came together principally on the basis of doing a photography project or doing something with Robert and I, and then eventually just Robert, where the golden generation that, um, Vikings, uh, Witness Vikings, were already an existing group who had a routine, who met up every Friday between uh, 3 and 5 o'clock and then outside of that it was their own time that was already allocated on doing other activities. So for me I had to fit in with their routine and then try and work out you know, a relationship that worked for the benefit of the project but also to not impinge too much on their time that was set aside specifically to talk about Witness and rugby. Because uh, that framework already existed so it was yeah, by negotiation, but it kind of worked out quite well in the end. So how did the two respond after that first invitation with the cameras? Because they were quite different in a way, weren't mm, they? Yeah, I think uh, the Windmill Hill, because we, we had a couple of members who <coughs> all of them had never really had any interaction with photography, but we had two members that just really, like, absolutely ran with the idea of photography. Like, they were buying cameras themselves and printing themselves by the second session and they, I, they were bringing images to me like way more than I expected which was kind of strange because I didn't think that would happen with um, like a smaller group really because they weren't too responsive when I said here's a camera let's take some photos and they weren't really responsive the first one I think they were probably slightly apprehensive of what I was here for um, which is part of I guess with community projects is building relationships you know with these people is half the battle um, so they, initially they were kind of quite apprehensive but the Vikings it was just like the mass of people we had so much imagery so quickly yeah that it felt like How, it might be a struggle so like 400 and 480 images or something yeah, like yeah 19 disposable cameras 32 images coming back and yeah. then uh, yeah so there was a real wealth of images to work with and and that was quite exciting. We basically, what I'd asked them to do is I'd not looked at any of the images coming back from, I got them printed at Boots, and I went back and said, okay, all look at your own images and take the, take pick five that you think best describe you yeah. as a person or your routine. And the, and the parameters of the first exercise, because they, they couldn't, we found out they couldn't photograph inside the stadium for a number of legal reasons. So it was either what you did at the weekend or what you did on the build up to go and watch the rugby match on a Friday night or a Saturday. And uh, yeah, so it was just good. It was interesting to see their routine maps out and how maybe similar or different their lives were and what crossovers they were in terms of how they socialised outside of Witness. And then the five pictures that they most cherished or thought best represented them were, well, they were quite telling, really. So, I mean, one of them was the food bank picture. Um, so one of the ladies volunteered at a food bank on the day before she went to play rugby. And yeah, and after that, but we just had a real wealth of images, mm -hmm. and, and and from that is when we started building quite interesting links because we had this almost foundation body of work. Um, the groups weren't meeting because of active time constraints, but us as kind of practitioners coming in, part of our job is finding those links and finding these bridges, and we started finding that. Yeah, there was from one group, one was volunteering at a food bank, but from another group, they knew people who were using a food bank. Mm -hmm. So we started finding these little links that were kind of, would never have been there if we didn't use photography as like an engagement process. So that's why we found it really uh, important to build this foundation body of imagery through photography. Um, yeah. Yeah, so all the while we were kind of working at least, um, I don't know, we were working in collaboration through 
outside of the context of meeting the groups, I guess. Yeah. So we'd come back and we'd think, oh, how can we make this work? And where can we start developing synergies? Because the witness group had their own subgroup as well. They had the subcommittee that would meet with you and then to it's go back to the wider group, yeah. which I thought was quite an interesting notion. There was like these nominees that were, were particularly interested but also knew not to in, entail too much into the group that always meet for that, that short yeah. time on the Friday for their kind of regular get-together. But it meant that everyone was sort of involved but without mm -hmm. that, that pressure. Um, yeah, and there's no real onus or expectation for everyone to participate and I think uh, even though the, the willingness was there, their time was already allocated doing other things and they just, for the majority, they wanted to meet up and talk about witness. So yeah, the subgroup was created mm -hmm. to help facilitate the project, which was a really nice idea. And I think in the book I mentioned that I felt I was, I was dropped into their world, so, because they already existed as a group that talked about rugby and I was just chipping away saying, oh, how about a photography project? How about photography? How about this? How about that? And the end, they, they accommodated me rather than the other way around. Which is quite nice. And I think um, it kind of leads on to my next kind of topic or question about this idea of, of kind of learning curves and, and I remember you getting back to me about being concerned actually that um, the witness group maybe weren't engaging with the project in the same way as the Windmill Hill group mm -hmm. and as if, as if somehow that, that was a failure or, or, or something that you know wasn't correct and I think quite a lot within social engaged practice there's this slight fear of actually talking about the process if it's not considered to go the way you intended, as if there's a fear of talking around the failures that aren't actually failures, they're just learning curves of the process. But do you guys want to talk a little bit more about that, that idea or concept or in terms of this? Uh, I mean, like we, the focus of the book as yeah, well? Yeah, yeah, we, we were very much aware of being, we've always had an interest in this sort of kind of, this sort of work uh, from the past, you know, that's what we spoke about before we even never thought about doing projects together. Mm -hmm. uh, but what we always felt was missing from them projects was how did they get to that point? It was very, it was, the focus was always a show or a book or a newspaper or whatever it may, may be. But the actual real gut of the work, the real difficult bit is building those relationships, getting to where you got to. Uh, the mistakes that you made getting there, you know, all these are like just as important as these bits on the wall now. Mm. And they often got missed, so we thought that's why we did the publication. It was very much about, it was almost kind of a, it's a diary of everything that went right and what went wrong. Yeah, I would say um, social engagement with an emphasis on, on well being is always reduced down to one symbolic gesture. So it's either you get a painting at the end, you get an exhibition, you get a, a sculpture, but you very rarely get to see, as Robert said, the, the workings of it. And the workings are never smooth and they're not, um, they're not transferable. If we did it again, it wouldn't, have, we, you know, we couldn't use this as a, as a blueprint. Yeah, there's, but, no, there's no model to it, is there? But because there's no model, no, there's, there was a, maybe a need to write about the process and less about the outcome, mm. because the outcome is one thing, and it, you know, there's a sense of legacy around the images and the, and the book lends itself to that notion of legacy. But yeah, it, for a while it didn't work and I was panicking and flapping because there still was the expectation of a, an exhibition at the end because as I said, it was bookended by a beginning and an end. And it was, there was already, you know, it, there was a start and a finish to it and I had to do something mm -hmm. in between. So it was, it was interesting to think about oh, how to work around the idea of it not coming to fruition. And then, because we're working in tandem, Roberts was picking up steam and going well. I was like, oh, right, okay. So you, I've already got a measure of comparison within the same project, which is unusual. Yeah. Which, which we had to have that discussion, though, don't we? we did. And that's when this kind of came from that, this kind of like us collectively kind of thinking that the, it's, it's the culmination of the, the missing bits of previous projects we felt were missing. Yeah. And us kind of almost grounding ourselves as well, being like reassessing this and us kind of, I guess that assessment, if you saw a painter doing it, it might produce a painting while he's doing it. Whereas we were kind of really reflecting about the images that were made and there was no record of that. Mm. So it was almost, we felt we had to produce this yeah. as part of the process. And also exhibit it, because I think, the, you know, again, it could be a standalone object, but it was, came out as a, the notion of process came out to be something that had to be exhibited as well. So you can see the book, you can see the pictures, but it's also, it's, you know, it's everything that the project's made up. 
is made up of our weekly trips to, to witness and the, and the failures. And that's why the books exhibited in the frames, but each frame has a select, there's an intentionality behind exhibiting mm. a certain page. And we wanted it to be all on the same level. We didn't want any hierarchy between the images and exhibition and books, so it all kind of merged into, that's why we exhibited the actual book. Because mm -hmm. uh, it was very much, we, we don't see any, any kind of, like I say, hierarchy between the process and the results. So it all needed to be shown. That's why we kind of included it in the design. And even the designs of parts of the actual layout links to the publication as well. Mm -hmm. But then I'd say with, with the flip side of, of um, OpenEye being able to then exhibit these final visual outcomes um, from the community aspects, like Irene and Margaret, two ladies from uh, Windmill Hill, came and they got a sneak peek because they were doing BBC radio interview, um, which I think took up most of the gentlemen's afternoon. They, were pretty, <laughs> they talked for quite a long time um, about the project and the process and why they felt it was important. But um, the women were extremely proud of having their work within a gallery context. And in the local show in Halton, <coughs> at the Brindley, I remember Irene mentioning that she'd always kind of walked past the Brindley, yeah. thought it might be interesting to go in, but never went in. And actually, the first time she went in was when her own work was in the space. Mm -hmm. So it just talks a little bit about how the two actually can work together. And it's not that one is more than the other, <coughs> but it's about how they become a sum of, sum of kind of greater than their parts, essentially. Yeah, and I think also we took it upon ourselves to make an effort to produce new work and respond to the outcomes of the interim exhibition which I suppose we didn't have to do. We could have just finished the project, whatever was exhibited locally then got put up here at the, the yeah. open eye. Yeah. But we went back in, with me working with the, the Witness Rugby Group, I felt I'd, I'd failed them in some way because I didn't do, once the project got exhibited and they saw what was on the walls and we had more discussions, I realised I could have done the whole project completely differently. So there was an effort to yeah. fix that. And, that's and, and then it's again questioning what's an exhibition. You know, it's nothing final. So no. very much, the Brindley was it was a midpoint for us. It was an experiment. We were tried, loads of stuff worked, loads of stuff didn't, and uh, we kind of assessed that. And we went back with the, all the members of the group, pretty much, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and kind of asked them what they thought worked and what didn't. Yep. And then we went forward from that, and then that's where we found out some extra bits, didn't mm -hmm. we, about groups? Yeah, which is yeah, different kind of ways of presenting work yeah. because the. It's ultimately not the product of the photographer or any individual. These projects exist because of the groups that are involved, and if they uh, have some further input and there's time to rectify it and change it and readdress aspects that have been overlooked yeah. or underlooked. That's uh, why we were lucky in that sense that we had that uh, exhibition with quite a big space between this mm -hmm. one. I know that other groups have it quite, had it quite close. Quite tight, they? yeah. Um, we had a lot of like reflection time with that. Mm -hmm. so, we, so we used that to our advantage. We used it as this kind of review almost of an exhibition. First draft. Yeah, first draft. <laughs> um, and in terms of, of collaboration, it wasn't just obviously yourselves with the groups, but it's a choice. I mean, you talked about it a little bit, but I wonder if you talk about a bit more about why, as practitioners, you wanted to collaborate, or it felt right to collaborate together on the project as well, with this particular type of kind of socially engaged mm. practice, what that brings to it, because you're one of only another pair that decided to kind of work in that way? Mm. Um, I guess we, 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 just, we just had, I think what kind of worked for me was we had similar interests but different backgrounds. Mm. So kind of bringing those kind of new backgrounds together on a similar platform could potentially produce something quite interesting. Well, yeah. <laughs> um, um. So that's why I thought it'd work, and that's why I very rarely work with like photographers again, or like the same uh, kind of backgrounds can kind of almost clash sometimes, and almost stunt like ideas. Um, whereas we have quite a varied background really, mm. don't we, between us. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'd say for the exact same thing, really. I mean, I was I've, I've, I tried to do a similar project when I was doing my PhD about uh, well-being and health in Hume. And, I've, and I wrote a bid for a project and it didn't get accepted. But it was about identifying gaps in the health provisions. Yeah, was that the one that was on the board? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, 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 okay. So, um, and I used to be a youth worker. And I used to work for an events company that did a lot of, I used to work for the Salford City Council. So I've done lots of engagement and I think, and I've worked with photographs and photography but never 
with the kind of end result of it being exhibited. But, but I've done that with film, so it was just a re yeah, just a different way for me to exercise some skills or reapply them and learn new ones. Because even though I teach photography, this is my first photographic yeah. exhibition or my um, or first contribution to an exhibition. <laughs> another side to it, I think we both knew about each other's work separately. So on the other yeah. side, we just like we were quite like liked each other's practice. So uh -huh. It just kind of worked in that sense as well. Mm. So, good to work with you, mate. So would you recommend um, for this type of practice highly that it might be benefit to yeah. work together? I highly so. recommend it. Uh, on the kind of, well, I think I mentioned before, that was like the idea of a solo artist going into a group of people can almost be quite uh, daunting, I think, for the group of people. Mm. Whereas if you're almost a collective, you're a little group of people meeting another group of people. It's kind of like two kind of like gangs meeting, like just kind of hanging out together. So I think I think that although it sounds like it shouldn't work, that it, it, it does when we when we kind of like work together with people. You you you're almost going in as a community group meeting another community group, just with kind of different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. and it kind of helps. I found personally anyway than just one artist going in. I think you might have to build a little bit more in relationships when that's the situation. Yeah, or quite, often, trust yeah, or well. quite often if, if there's a producer or curator within that role, I would recommend they, they should go with you for that yeah. initial yeah. kind of meeting. Because also you don't want to have the weight of that organisational responsibility on your mm. shoulders as yeah, well. Yeah, they yeah, should yeah. also represent um, to the group about what it's mm. about. Yeah, and you know, for, for one another we acted as a sounding board in the same way we ran ideas past the groups. So you could run them past your, your co-worker and I think that's important. Yeah. As well as Liz. Good ear, good, uh, <laughs> good point of contact. But yeah, I think it's just good to have someone to share yeah, an idea with. And it's just, it's kind of the constant evaluation with these projects as well. I find it quite difficult just write, maybe writing about the session that I've just done with a group of people. Whereas if we, I just ring up Gary or Gary rings up me, mm -hmm. and it's that's the discussion and that's the evaluation there. So you've already got that kind of development process. It's quite a bit easier when you've got someone to reflect with, mm -hmm. in that sense. Yeah, yeah, it's completely great. And, and talking about this idea of evaluation, um, there's a lot of work going on at the moment, which is great, actually, around the kind of complexities of socially engaged practice in terms of how you validate that type of practice to funders, to commissioners, to your own art sector, actually, in some cases. Um, and a lot of things can come down to the crux of, of what you assess as quality outcomes still mm -hmm. because we've come from a system that has always looked at the outcomes. But how would you, this is a bit of a difficult question, sorry, I'm put to you. How would you <laughs> consider the idea of validating quality outcomes in social engaged practice based on kind of what you've learned from this process and, and previous? Do you want to start out? Uh, <laughs> I would say ultimately the experience of the user. So it's whether they or one individual person has had a positive outcome and they've gained or benefited from it or developed or yeah I think it's that's why I, I eventually got over the concern about having, maybe having nothing to exhibit because we were still having fun and they were developing skills and new interests and a sub photography subcommittee was developed and new conversations were had and I think, yeah, it's about the user, I think, ultimately. But it all depends on the framework in which that evaluation takes place. So as an academic, I've got to adhere to the research excellence framework, the REF, which... Um, Sounds like a headache in the <laughs> yeah, title. <laughs> which, so there's already someone at work asking me how I can write an impact statement about how this work has uh, been successful. But it's so a do whole you think, different you think that's, set of do you aims. Think that's a problem within it. Yeah, I think. Well, it depends. It's to do with the flow of money as well, isn't it? I guess. Yeah. You know, you've got to you've got to justify the value of it. So someone else then has another chance to do it again with a new set, a new pot of money. Um, so, but at the core, it's it's about the user, isn't it? I think mm -hmm. personally, I think if they've had a good time. Because I used to have to do it as a youth worker. You know, how did how did the youth project? How was it successful? It's because people turned up. It's, you know, that's the ultimate outcome, isn't it? You know, they wouldn't, if they weren't enjoying it. They wouldn't come, whether they painted the wall blue or, you know, started a football team at the end of the summer. Mm -hmm. 
you know, you still need people to do the activities that you expect to evaluate at the end. So as long as the people are still there. I think that's some I'm testament. A question at you. Do you feel that that is? Because uh, oh, you're not answering them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do you feel like that um, is a problem with it in socially engaged photography? That it's just doing because it could just be a community group in a football club, just a youth club. Yeah. Do you feel like it's just that, or is there? Because I feel like what well, well, I'm asking a question, I'm answering it. I feel yeah. like there's more to it than that. That there's kind of. We, uh, I think we maybe entice something out of. Oh, we have a contribution to it as well. I think. Yeah. Um, but how you measure impact mm -hmm. or value is is really subjective. Cause yeah. It's to do with the framework that's applied to it. Mm -hmm. So for me, uh, at a very simple level, uh, I had fun, and I think the groups enjoyed it. And then, and that's enough. Yeah. But I don't know how you would. I don't know. Write that How I would write that to yeah. our funders. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, everyone had a great time. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I obviously agree with that, but I think we're in a really interesting position within this sort of practice that um, <coughs> or at this, the idea of validation is, is kind of, it's almost not needed, but it's only needed because of funding situations. Mm. Um, and within that within the art world you've got to do it you've got to somehow kind of validate it whereas and this sort of work is becoming kind of thankfully a lot of, it seems like a lot more people are interested in it um, there's going to be that constant question in the next five to ten years of how that's going to be validated yeah but always the point like when i said like the almost needs to be some sort of like social engagement kind of council mm. that kind of has some sort of method of going this has got this, this has got this, that's great, that's got what. But it can never be too up. prescriptive either. That's no, the thing. So if you're doing a photography project, and, and which is why I think the idea of process and the book was interesting, because if the Women of Windmill Hill didn't exist as a group before that, and then we took them on a few photo walks, then they're engaging in health and well-being, because they're out and they've been mobile, and they're chatting, and as a result they've become more sociable, um, as well as yep. learning a new skill, then they're all possibly tangible outcomes that make it mm -hmm. a success. Um, <coughs> but then it but in comes terms down of its validation, it? yeah, you still got a, there's still an expectancy to exhibit, which is why I still had that panic. Mm. So, so that we put on you. Yeah. But actually the community groups. But got it's what a they lot wanted as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, definitely. In fact it's probably the, the, the biggest bit a lot of people got out of it. Is mm. seeing works of their own. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's a struggle as well, but when it comes to fruition, it's really rewarding. That's another you know, good outcome. Okay, and then specifically within the context of kind of photography as a medium itself, um, which is kind of why we're all here today, what would you say the benefits and maybe on the flip side, conflicts or tensions of using that medium within social engaged practice is or has been for you? I'm writing a research degree about this, so I really yeah, want to so listen to your answer on this. Research. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, I, I think that the reason why photography is probably used a bit more in it in that sort of process recently is because um, if a painter went in, I don't know why I keep referencing someone who's a painter, but um, if a painter went in, a lot of people would say, "Oh, I can't do that landscape, or I can't do this." Whereas with a photograph you could all ultimately take the exact same photograph. You could do a workshop and say, we're going to do a landscape. I want to show you how to do a landscape. Mm -hmm. And you could take 10 around about the same imagery. And then, it, it, for me, that kind of builds, get, builds confidence for the participants then. They kind of, oh, maybe I can do a bit of this. You know, and they kind of feel like there's a, they're kind of learning something quite quickly from those sorts of processes. So I think in that sense, it's really, uh, it's quite exciting actually this sort of project that it kind of skips that uh, bit of the kind of the technical aspects of painting or drawing or sound or whatever is quite instant and quite quick you can almost get to the, the meaty bit the body of the project quite quick uh, through photography uh, but also everyone's a photographer now everyone's got a camera everyone's taken a picture pretty much Everybody Every has access to that. Mm -hmm. And if they don't, it's something that's relatively cheap that we can help them with. Um, so in that sense, it's, uh, it, it kind of makes, um, I guess, working with people a lot more accessible with this sort of medium. 
uh, and it speeds up the process of working together, I think. But don't quote me on that. <laughs> I'd agree. I'd say the exact same thing. Um, <laughs> it is, it's just it's very utilitarian. Everyone can use it. It doesn't take uh, a great deal of skill, but it offers back a lot of information. I think if you look at a picture and you discuss it and you discuss yeah. maybe... The framing, choice of framing, what you were thinking at that time. I think there's a, you can read in and around you know, the, the kind of act of the photograph as well as mm. the photo in different ways. And a great example is our first session with both groups, building a massive body of work in two sessions. Now, if you, a lot of the time, if you worked in a different medium, that wouldn't that wouldn't work like that. And I think you can only progress <coughs> when you evaluate from what you've made. So initially, we've got a ton of material that we can work from. Yeah, and where people might find it difficult to articulate something verbally, you can almost take a picture that alludes to your point that you're trying to make, which, which is more clearly communica communicatable than maybe a painting, because it's quicker mm -hmm. and not everyone can paint. Mm -hmm. You can definitely take a snapshot. Yeah, and that doesn't say we exclude other mediums. No, no, we did definitely uh, not. We tried loads of different things. We, we did. even did like installation drawings. You know, like where it comes down to like, what would you do with a cube like this? Mm -hmm. How would you have your pictures? How would you sit them? So the curatorial side of a lot of the projects, especially with the Brindley, like I said, was very much an experimental process. You know, we drew out rooms and said, where would you put images? We tried film. We tried film. We did some yeah. We did some moving image, mm -hmm. film, illustration. And the ladies did. Poetry as well, didn't they? Poetry, yeah. yeah, yeah. Which I can't say I could help them with, but... <laughs> they helped you, I think. Yeah, they yeah, helped they helped you. me with. But, uh, and uh, both groups did elements of archival research, whether they were aware of it or not. Yeah, yeah. Women of Women Hill. Uh, Irene went back and found the original pamphlet that the residents were given when they moved into the estate about this ideal utopia, which we uh, kind of did a new version for... What was the book fair? At the IC, I can't remember. Yeah, we did like a, yeah, we did a quick kind of new modern update with the women's um, poetry and some new images that they took, and then the Witness Rugby Group went back and used the archive of uh, Mick or Mike Flynn. He's like an amazing photographer who was in there. Who, oh, that's funny. Yeah, yeah. Who became yeah. part of their group, and then when I got to understand what they're doing a bit more, uh, Dennis is over here, helped him in the dementia group, and um, but his images had like a number of different values because they were his memories, they were his points of contact to the other group. Um, yeah, so we built, oh, that was one of his pictures, but we had... Uh, the black and white one, just yeah. here. So as part of like when you're working with groups, obviously there's a bit of give and take. So we had a couple of requests from both of the groups for what we could do for them. Um, and one of them, <coughs> so we produced, we kind of almost got directed a little bit first, didn't we? Yep. It was completely and, their design. And uh, I just put it together through the archive images. And it, what size was it printed? I can't remember now. Oh, huge. Um, have, you, have you got the print? No, no, OK. You no. can take it today if you can vote. Yeah, it's here. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we got a, a huge reusable print that they can take away and, you know, hang up in their social space, their commune, basically. Um, so th there were a lot of that, again, that side of the project where it's kind of like the practitioners are giving back to the groups, mm -hmm. often gets missed, I think, as well, in projects. Yeah. Um, yeah, hence why we put them up here. And the ladies have set up their own photography, yeah. amateur, amateur photography, self-named windmill amateur photography. Snappers. Snappers, that was it. Yep. Yeah, at the back of that, which is seven. Yeah. So they've already doubled the number of engagement people that, that we've done. Yeah, there you go. yeah, what does that say about us? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, that was great. I was, I was like, when you're looking at validation again, it's a legacy project and they kind of voluntarily started their own photography group and that is a uh, fortnightly thing now, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, and they've got an exhibition coming up, New Year. Yeah. Yeah, so it's kind of like, you know, a proper impact to the community mm. that is slowly building a group on its own now, which is really important to this sort of stuff. Yep. And then what about any potential tensions or conflict that you feel working with photography? I'm not saying there has to be any. You could say it's great, but... Yeah, I, don't, I, I, I guess kind of like, te like on a boring side, like the technical aspect of it was kind of... 
because a couple of members got more interested in in that side of it than others, and um, I think almost it kind of sometimes slowed down the process of what we were interested in. Uh, there were like a couple of members were really interested in like that field and stuff like that, which is all very important. But if we started in going into all that, we would probably lose the rest of the group, and they'd kind of get a little bit bored of it. So where we could, where I could, I. I kind of informed them with that. So that's kind of a limitation within it, technicality for me, but I don't see any limitation of photography, personally. It's like obvious as that sounds, it's constantly evolving and everything into it. Yeah, because there's so much potential. <coughs> you can be, you know, you can change on a whim what you want to do. You can go from taking photos to doing archival work. I just think it's really flexible, robust, good medium. <laughs> Top tip. <laughs> I think that's an excellent point to open it out to the room <laughs> on that positive note. Um, if anyone else has any questions or comments for the lads or me or Dennis. There's, there's kind of always been a tension with that in the history of kind of socially engaged practice. <coughs> and I, the only way we'll kind of get rid of it is if we keep doing it, I think, okay. the more that we do it. And I think if we kind of, yeah, just, just, just doing that will challenge it. I think it just needs to be brought to light a bit more and to the point where it almost won't become voyeuristic, hopefully. Um, yeah, I think, hmm, it's a good question, that. It is, yeah. I think... Voyeurism, you can't help voyeurism because it's, it's the pleasure of looking at someone else's world, isn't it? You know, it's that chance to look in at someone else's window and see what's going on. Yeah. So it's, it's an innate desire of voyeurism. Mm -hmm. Whether socially engaged practice perpetuates voyeurism, I think eventually if you keep doing it, it'll become reciprocal. And people will see what's going on and it'll become part of the, just the, the conversation in whichever it's crouched. So in this case, well-being. Yeah. And I think the more you do... Social engaged photography around well-being, health well-being, for example, then it just becomes less voyeuristic and more normal. Right? And there's the point of photography is always voyeuristic. Mm. Yeah, you exactly. can't escape it. So when you're using photography, there's always going to be that there, to a degree. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, what did you um, when you started to when you started the project? What did you want to learn from it, and what did you Think that the people who collabor you collaborated collaborated with wanted to learn as well. And did you ever think that the two could kind of come together, or yeah. did you see there being distinct differences between what you wanted to learn and what you felt they wanted to learn? Yeah, I'd, I'd say I, I think that obviously we both learned quite a lot through the process, but I think maybe the bit that um, probably more for the participants than anyone else is. Uh, they probably think that we know a lot what we're doing and what we're kind of like, what direction we're going in, whereas it is a complete um, learning curve, especially with any new group. So we are learning from each other, definitely. It's, it's, it's almost like building like a friendship, you know. It's kind of like you're, you're kind of like treading the water with each other a little bit mm. and kind of seeing where, which bits work and all that kind of stuff. So we definitely learn from each other on that aspect. But as kind of like practitioners, I feel that there's maybe a couple of kind of workshops or kind of starting points that I wanted to try, see if they worked. Uh, so I, I learned some things from that personally. And um, specifically what was the uh, just engaging? Uh, so it was, it, was, it was just very basic kind of starting points for workshops, just kind of like what kind of, um, what kind of starting points would uh, maybe uh, kind of put the group at ease when it comes to ideas 
you do have that thing where you, you could produce a lot of imagery and no one can be critical with the work. So they can kind of say, oh, they might like a bit of theirs a little bit. Or they might like this one over here because it's got a flower in or something. But there's no kind of proper analysis. So kind of starting that through using different methods was a learning curve for me. So how to kind of... Because I think there's a stigma of it being in a gallery, you have to be some sort of like high up artist kind of guy who talks in long words all the time. And then there's that barrier instantly with people who haven't taken a photograph before who's going to have an exhibition. So you have to kind of kind of bring that level down and make them aware that their kind of viewpoint is important. So through these different, I was totally aware of that through previous projects that I've done, that I had to work on that person and myself. Um, and I think a lot of people do. I don't think there's no right or wrong way to do that. Um, but again, it was gauging the group and how we could maybe just ca have a bit of fun. With, it, it sounds so like heavy and like, you know, just being in this space, it can be intimidating. You know, and a lot of the people, it's the first time they've been to a gallery. So kind of making it fun as well. Mm. It's like a learning curve. Uh, because we, you know, we come from an academic background, don't we? And we have to write 10,000 word dissertations on that, an image. Yeah. And then we're presenting 600 images in front of someone. So it's, it's bringing that down a little bit and kind of making people aware that their viewpoint's relevant. So that was a big learning curve in the sense of how we all know that's what we want to do, which is how we do that. That's, that was definitely a learning curve for me. I would agree. <laughs> it's, 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 it's exactly right. Yeah, it's just <laughs> the exact same thing. I mean, I started the project with no expectations for outcome, or even though I did panic, as I said before, about maybe there being no outcome. It was the learning curve was just to work with things on the hoof, you know, ad hoc and see what happens and then just respond to it. Because I'm used to having complete control over what I do because I lecture and it's structured. And so, yeah, was, yeah, that was, I guess, that kind of freedom of it, which Rob said. And it became fun. And once you start having fun with it, it doesn't really matter as much, I don't think. Define good photos. <laughs> um, there, there is a level that is expected when you come to a gallery, which I think we've tried to kind of push a little bit. Mm -hmm. Not saying that, um, I think, again, looking at what is expected in the gallery and it almost being an intimidating space. You know, it, everything being pristine in frames. You know, we've done like prints on walls, books in frames. It's a frame action over there, text on image. We've done all sorts of different stuff. So it's it's kind of, you know, what do you class as a, a good image? But then I think it's what the participants think is a good image. So it's I think there's that barrier there with what is a good image, almost, that they kind of almost feel like they couldn't produce something to a certain standard. So, yes, it does have to be a good image. <laughs> But there's a process for it, definitely. I mean, we didn't just throw these images up. We worked through you know, it's the results of an exhibition as a starting point, and then working down from maybe a thousand images to yeah. 12, and really defining the ideas. I think that's, again, with the process and the background of all that, makes them good images. Yeah, I think there's a, there's a curatorial process, though, that helps shape uh, the exhibition so it fits the remit and the expectations of cert certain audience members and but that also includes Robert and I in our decision making about which images to choose but then that's included by the groups because they pick the initial selection and then we blow them up and we work with them and we go back yeah. and say what, how do you think this looks and <coughs> so yeah I think but it's a subjective thing I mean because there'll be people here who won't like the images for one reason or another because they're not in a frame or so it's just, yes. yeah, there's a number of reasons why people will and won't like it, I think. And it's especially difficult in a photographer's gallery. <laughs> yeah. So it's, there's a, cer a certain audience expecting certain things, certain new, new audiences or different audiences not expecting different things, so it's finding that balance as well. So when you're working with, it's working with the place as well, mm -hmm. finding that kind of, because they know the audience better than we do, comes to these places.
And how, how do you define a good image? Yeah, Can I ask? <laughs> it's, a t it's a difficult one, isn't it? Yeah. It all comes down to uh, context, essentially, mm -hmm. with most things. I think if you can back up an image, if there's a story behind it, with this sort of work, I think that kind of justifies the image being in the space. And I think if, for me, when working with this stuff, it is about the stories, it is about the process, it is about the people, and if it's got that behind it, it works, I think. Yeah. Because I was really interested in process and less about the quality of the image. So I said, which is why I really like the idea of the book. And then the book being exhibited because it was, because they're the bits you don't see about well-being. You know, these are just yeah. the outcomes of our work with them. And then how they're valued is, is then, you know, then it becomes another conversation with a whole different other host of people. Okay. Uh, this is a question but a little bit more about provocation about what you basically statement about um, how important is process, uh, how important is to have fun and uh, mm -hmm. developing along the, along the way. And um, so why why those projects would be run by artists and not anyone else? What, what an artist brings to, to the process? Oh, I don't know. Um. Oh, that's a very good question. What, what did we bring that? What in uh, opposed to who else? Do you mean any other professionals? Yeah, yeah. Community? Like a community worker support. Yeah, so yeah. so uh, we it's you know it's it's well documented that arts is good for well-being. Mm. And we are artists, and that's <laughs> our profession. So we'll show them how to make it. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's not to boil it down so simply, but. Kind of that's our expertise, and it's it is good for well-being and it's good for health to produce and make and create. As much as I don't like that word, but you know, make things with people as well collectively is can be really beneficial to people who maybe don't get out too much. Mm. Um, especially with visual work, I think that's quite a big deal for a lot of people. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't know, how do you feel about it? Because you, you've worked previously with uh, the council and stuff, and your youth groups and stuff. Yeah. Like, did you produce so much visual stuff with that? Yeah, quite a lot. Um, did you feel like you got more response from it? Or was it just like the people that came? It, it depends, because it works two ways. Cause we, and it depends on the outcome and the output and people's expectations. Because we did, when I worked for the council as a youth worker, you could say, well, why a youth worker and why not? priest or why not, uh, yeah. I don't know, a social worker and what's the different dynamic that that particular profession brings. But then when it comes to the production of art or something aesthetically pleasing, we also hired in third party agencies to develop art projects with the young people. So I think you need a bit, yeah, I think you need an element of professionalism depending on the output, on the outcome, I think. And I think it's just covering another... Uh, kind of medium in a sense where that um, the group in Windmill Hill came together knowing it was photography so they had some sort of interest in it whereas the Vikings they had their subcommittee that were interested mm -hmm. in it so we're not going to appeal to everybody there's going to be a, a number that it really resonates with so but lots of other people can do it as well because yeah. I think the person who instigated the project and then as the project took off he retired was Cliff Mm -hmm. yeah, Richard, yeah. Uh, Richards. not the singer, but a doctor. <laughs> uh, and he, yeah, he was he was a doctor who he loved he, art. He loved art, yeah. Loved so, art. so different people can do it. I think different people bring different strengths and skill sets, and and then, but equally, you know, really anyone could do it. I suppose. I think it's about that opportunity to work with with more people, not rather mm -hmm. or. And I think the. The Young People's Project in Gallery 2 is a kind of prime example of that, where the support workers who work with those young people are incredibly creative and incredibly enthusiastic, and they work day in and day out with those young people. But bringing someone who's an outsider from a particular skill set in just brings another dynamic to that experience. It uplifts what the support workers feel they can do as part of that process, as well as the young people. And actually, sometimes I think that like we still work with that young group on a new project, and then. Um, very much I think the support workers will now be part of the Open Eye Gallery family forevermore. And actually it's not just about what the photographer relationship and photography as a medium brought to 
the, the participants, if you like, but also those around that sector. So actually, how do the community support workers and, and other members of staff that support those communities, what do they also get out of it as well? Um, it, it, back to that kind of question. questions around what does a photographer bring. I, I suppose in the same way as any other any other discipline, if you spend your whole life looking at photographs, taking photographs, you have a certain kind of approach, vocabulary, sense of possibility that comes from the photograph. And I was interested in that photograph there with the guy with your head. Irene? Irene. Irene. Yeah. Yes. I was talking to Irene at the Runcorn point of view where she sort of said, you know, it's great to see it this big. I don't, you know, I don't, everyone seems to like that photograph. I don't seem to, I don't know why does everybody like that photograph. And mm -hmm. clearly you must have said to her, you like that photograph. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so it was something that she picked up on from you. It was actually the second choice of a photograph. So there was even a discussion behind this, which we instantly thought was a really strong image, um, it was actually the second choice. The first choice was, a, was this guy, actually. Can you believe it or not? This guy in the front cover. Another one that Irene took. When we were going back to kind of like technical aspects, it's actually totally out of focus when you get close to it. But um, when, we, when I was talking about the ideas of how you evaluate imagery, and different methods that I was trying to use with that. One of them was um, asking them to kind of what they thought of an image that didn't get too much attention. So if there was an image on the table that kind of got left out, I'd kind of go, let's talk about these ones. What do you think of these? Because they instantly dismissed them, but they'd taken them. And why did they take them? And what were they about? Um, so that was kind of, that kind of stemmed from one of those exercises of kind of, um, making them realise that their kind of visual eye was important in all aspects, but maybe it wasn't taken in a certain way that they wanted to. Whereas I, I kind of explained to them that this was really sharp, really in focus. It's a young lad. Irene was really interested in kind of uh, young men on the estate, not in that way, <laughs> in the sense that she was worried about their well-being basically and the kind of yeah, decline of the estate. Um, and she's really clued up with that sort of thing, is Irene. So that's how we kind of warm towards these two like younger men. Uh, but on second choice, it came down to technicality with that. Um, but again, it was one of the side foes that wasn't there. And I was trying to challenge them to kind of reevaluate, um, maybe throw away stuff, which I think we all need to do as practitioners, you know, when we're all trying to do things. It's often where I come back to projects and looking through sketch pads and I'm like, why didn't I investigate that a bit more? Why didn't I come back to that? and that maybe I should do now. Oh, sorry. Um, so I was trying to use that process with them in a quite a short way, I guess. Rather than being years apart in my sketchbook, I was trying to get them to evaluate all their images. So that's how we kind of got to that image anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but the rest, we were kind of, I don't know how we kind of got to them all really, did we? Because we had so many, we did have a selection I mean, we got it down to a hundred, and that was a headache. Yeah, all the all the witness ones, all the rugby club ones, were based on the initial five that they picked from the photo exercise at the beginning, and that didn't change. And then we decided which ones would you want exhibited, and then for the Windmill Hill, yeah, I think the same thing really. We just did repeat the process again and again, and yeah. discussed what was interesting, what wasn't. You know why do you, why is the why do you consider that one valuable and not the other and yeah but it was all all the decisions were ultimately made by them and then we decided how to yeah how big they were on the wall I guess but every image is is theirs except for yeah. one at the end and the one at the front yeah which we we felt just kind of the end one was a result of the Brindley exhibition where um, uh, predominantly it was quite archival their part of the exhibition. And that's when the conversation opened about the side things that they do as a group helping. So we went to the... Yeah, this is the witness group. Witness so group. we found out yeah. that after a while, they were really involved with the dementia 
outreach team. Uh, some of the members of tennis who just left is one of the organisers of the Dementia Outreach. The a couple of members of the Witness Rugby Gold Generation group also uh, do charity rugby matches. So that was a charity match against the A and E uh, department, local and they, hospital, and they basically to raise cash. Just said, can you just photograph us doing this? Yes, yeah. we'd really like that. We don't want to take any more pictures. Was their exact? Yeah, was like, don't know more pictures, but can you document us? So we did. Yeah, sometimes that can be half the challenge if you come at it from such a, mm. you know, determination to make, sh you know, you want to make it that they have that ownership in maybe the way it's they've produced the image. But actually, sometimes it's about listening back to them and saying, actually, this project is about me, and therefore I do want to be in front of the camera. Mm -hmm. I want to be the subject yeah, matter. Yeah, yeah. And there's a maybe they a preconception that's not, it, yeah. not the case. But yeah. yeah, it's almost like you had to go through that process for them to feel comfortable to go, actually, no, we, we want you to document us. Definitely. That is how we want mm -hmm. to be yeah. represented as your role as photographer. So, yeah. and some of the, pro the different projects have taken very different approaches throughout the programme on, uh, on that, so. Mm. Sorry, there was a... I'm sorry, I missed the talk of a bit later, apologies. It, it strikes me that what you're doing is providing opportunities for people to tell their stories in a way that people who don't know their stories can feel or access somehow. So firstly, is that right? And secondly, if it is right, is there a way to, how does that, how does that help evaluation of whether or not this is a good thing that should be funded and done in this country? Um, do you want me to? This is the project manager. Um, <laughs> So yes, it's exactly about um, working with people so that they have the chance to tell their own story in a way that they feel comfortable about. Um, and we were talking earlier in the discussion about this question around evaluation and, and validation of this type of practice and actually how um, a lot of it can actually come through anecdotal comments through the participants or collaborators themselves, um, as through the photographers. Sometimes you're constantly evaluating and shifting the projects as you go along. And so it is quite complex in terms of how you validate that um, in evaluation to then, say, put to a funder for, for future commissioning. And I think half the battle is actually supporting the funding bodies to go on that journey of changing the way they validate this type of practice as well. Um, and it's not to say that this is the only type of practice they should therefore consider, it's just about how they understand that type of practice. So they actually understand better where their money is going and, and what the kind of um, domino effect, I guess, um, of impacts actually can be beyond, you know, people being happy that their work is in a gallery show. Um, and I think a lot of that will come down to working with the partners within those different sectors. So how the health sector go about approaching kind of, um, kind of soft, soft evaluation they call it, soft yeah. and hard, yeah. um, visual outcomes, um, but also about yeah, supporting those funders to, to understand the different ways. So a good example actually of that is um, Access Web. I don't know if you have heard of them, but um, they're an artist kind of networking membership, um, which if you're practitioners, I would highly recommend joining. It's a support network for artists, it helps profile your work, but it has a whole kind of plethora of support around um, socially engaged practice and one of the things they're doing at the moment um, is looking and investigating in how you validate that type of practice um, to actually kind of create a very accessible report which can be used not only for the artists themselves but also to pass along to the to the non-art sectors that you're partnering with for better understanding for them to go back to their funders and then to our kind of major kind of say arts council style funders and that's partnered with MMU um, as a university partner so having that academic rigor which actually in the sake of kind of validation actually is still very important for that. Does that answer the question? Okay. Sorry. Yeah. I find it quite interesting really in terms of what you're saying about you know validation and how you demonstrate outcomes, particularly because this seemed to have been commissioned by a clinical commissioning group mm -hmm. who their outcomes will be very stringent in terms of has it improved health outcomes in terms of lower presentation at GP practices or you know, reduced usage of medication. So they have very validated tools um, that they will use. 
So it's kind of how that can influence actually a project such as this really and you stay true to you know the methodology really that you're using and that doesn't actually influence the choice and, and the practice mm -hmm. and it's in particular relation to the photograph um, around the food bank and the choice of quote mm -hmm. that goes with it and actually who owns that piece of work now mm -hmm. because it was taken by somebody who volunteers does that and it was something that they do before they go playing rugby. But for me, that's now owned by the CCG to demonstrate, you know, oh, this is really bad. Mm. It's a travesty of our time. It, you know, this is about poor health outcomes and it's completely changed for me. And maybe this isn't correct because I don't know who chose to put that quote up, but it's completely changed the message behind that photograph. Mm -hmm. So what do you think the message would be if the quote wasn't there? That, that it actually is, it's a food bank. I, I would probably read into it that, yeah, it's a food bank and that's awful, but for the person taking it, from what you mm -hmm. said, and this is what I took from, that she took it because it, she was, yeah, this is something I do. Mm -hmm. I'd, like, I'd like to actually show people this is something that I do. It feels good for me. I feel like I'm giving back to my community. And then I go and take part in a community activity. I'm part of the rugby community. Mm -hmm. So it's just how, you know, sort of, I suppose, your opinion on how funders or commissioners of this work can really influence the practice and the outcomes for what they want. Mm. Yeah. I'm going to let Sarah answer, the, yeah, answer that question. Is that, is that the quote it was my decision, not Dave's. No. Um, and not the artist's. And not the artist's. Because no. that could be, for me, in the CCGs and the will report. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think that this, that there's been a question for a long time about instrumentalising art or not instrumentalising art. Um, I, think it's a, I, I think it's a sort of false question in a way. Um, because I think, the reason that I think it's a false question is that these things are kind of always set in opposition to each other, as if we don't all belong to a kind of collective community or community of people that all have an interest in health and well-being mm. or an interest in how things are funded. And actually, I think for me, what's interesting about a lot of these projects, so if you if you look at the dementia project, for instance, so mm. a, a photographer working with, with, surf, yeah. Yeah, with the surf group, that project came about because that group works very closely with the NHS. Um, and their interest is raising awareness mm. about dementia, what it's like to live with dementia, and also very much about them thinking about how other people see them. Mm. Um, so I think the it was definitely from the beginning seen to be instrumental in a way. And I think there's a, there's a sort of issue, there's a sort of issue because I think people, this project was about health and well-being mm. and I think people hit artists that work in that way over the head with this idea that you're being instrumental um, and I kind of feel that actually if you look at any funding system with public money, there is also the other side of it which says this is public money, why should we just give money to artists? And there's always that question there, from the public's point of view. I mean, certainly <coughs> if you run a gallery, not so much a photography gallery, but actually other types of gallery, from the public point of view, it's, this is public money. <coughs> and you're deciding, there's a very definite norm, which is a curator deciding what culture should be shared with the world. So there's already, if you like, a hierarchy in there with somebody who has a very particular type of training making a decision about what is good, what isn't good. And actually, I think this project's been very definitely about a whole group of people coming together, all of whom have input. And <coughs> the health side of things as much 
as the art side of things. It's more arts funding, I should say, than it is health funding or any other type of um, institution. I kind of think there shouldn't be a one is right and one isn't right. And actually we're very supportive of Bolton and also supportive of the idea that actually food bank shouldn't be something that's necessary for the world. And I kind of, I don't feel that, I don't know, but I, I don't feel that this idea that there is a privileged voice completely within this project or any of the projects should be, should be there. Actually, there's lots of voices here, and the groups that came together because of Holton CCG is kind of, so I suppose in a way I'm kind of just challenging the idea that within the art sector, there is this horror of the arts being used in a particular way, because they are all the time. They are in every single cultural organization. Artists and artists' work is used to develop the career of the curator. And, or the curator is developing their career on the back of the artist, the artist is developing the curator's career. They're all, all of these things are already have a sort of set of vested interests. Mm -hmm. And actually concealing them, I'm not sure, is the way to actually look at those things. I, I don't know, this is just my perspective. I don't know. What do you guys think? About the image or the text or its function? No, I suppose about the idea that the voices come through. Well, we're, 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 all, we're all on a lev level playing field mm -hmm. when it comes to these sorts of projects. It, again, again, that's when authorship comes in. So it was just quite interesting who, who is the author. Um, but w when it boils down to that, there is no hierarchy. It's a, it's a, it's a comp if, you, if it can be, it's a completely collaborative affair. Mm -hmm. um, we never go in and think we've got less decision or anything like that. We try and be as <coughs> collectively thinking as possible. Um, so yeah, the answer to that is we're all on the same level. Mm -hmm. So there, we did we did meet uh, Dave Sweeney. He came to our exhibition, and that was a quote. That, that's what he said in response to the image in its initial iteration, which didn't obviously didn't have his quote over it. Yeah. So when we were at the Brindley, it was blown up maybe. We're twice the size of that. Yeah. yeah. And he said, the image has travelled through our time and we'll look back upon it with shame, which I thought, we, and, it, and we'd never and forgot it. He said it straight out. So We've only known him for two minutes. And he's the man who's completely in control of, uh, I don't know, the, fund, the health budget well for CCG. Yeah, so, um, and then I think I don't know how the image. And we, can appears. we just add that this was originally an edit in our book anyway? So we did bring the quote and the image together as an edit. So it's, that's in the publication. So they kind of lived in a in a shared world in that yeah. form. And then I think and then I think maybe just to finish off with it, it's you know it being there. You've got to manage the expectations of a lot of different stakeholders, and that also includes gallery visitors, mm -hmm. and their expectations of what photography is and how you know what it might communicate. So you saw as a food bank, and I did, but maybe other people wouldn't. So sometimes they have to be kind of crouched in or contextualised a bit further. But I, th I don't think it does the image any disservice, but it opens up other avenues for unpicking its value, I think. I'm just... Oh. Sorry. Sorry. Is, it, is it in connection to that? Yeah, and then yeah, I'll yeah, ask this gentleman. Ask, is he actually happy, happy with the cause? Yeah. Oh, yeah, we asked. Oh, yeah, we yeah. asked. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I rang him up and asked him first for the book, and then we double-checked yeah. with... It it's being this big. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty big. And has he, has he thought about the implications of, and the impact of that? As far as I know, he was straight up. He, go he, for it, he got he? back to me and said, Thanks for thinking of including me in this show, mm. is what he said to us. So. Have they mounted this exhibition there? Um, we had a local exhibition in Halton, which was in the summer. Um, which was a, a bigger display because obviously open eye we've had to fit in yeah. all seven projects within our space so um, actually all the images were much bigger scale weren't they? Mm. Yeah the um, space is about two or three times size of this room. So yeah, that image was as project. big as that print behind you? It, it finished, finished in September, yeah. uh, we have the prints upstairs so the idea is they go back to They're the going groups to go back to the groups if they yeah. want them. We do have some documents of them in the book, you can have a look later yeah. what scale they were and stuff. 
Um, sorry, you were very patient. I was just interested, obviously, the witness group, uh, oh, sorry, the, the, uh, the windmill the group of, of expanding and creating their own bone project. Mm -hmm. um, has, there, has there been any community links formed on a uh, more permanent basis, like between Roncor and Witness, and, and moreover between Witness, Roncor, Kirby, uh, the Wirral, and, and those? Kind of places as uh, you know, within the context of we've all been involved mm -hmm. in a similar project, uh, let's have a look at each other, and you know, let's have a, a community wide um, group where we cross on it. And, yeah, so and when will the first Hong Kong with this wedding be? <laughs> <laughs> So there, there actually has been quite a few kind of crossovers already. So, for example, um, off the back of meeting the Windmill Hill women, we were then introduced to young people from that area who we now are working with, who now work with the young people from Sefton. Um, there's been um, other areas where um, the groups are coming together kind of with open eye, I guess, as the central space, which is really interesting for us as a, a city centre-based gallery location is how we work not just as a gallery but how we work as this social kind of hub, this space for things to happen, for people to meet, for dialogue to, to engage with from all walks of life from the Merseyside kind of regions and um, so the Kirby women are meeting women from L8, the, the women from L8 were interested in the fact that a project had been done in the area, they're interested in the archives of the area and so we introduced them to the Kirby women who said, uh, which is the project over here, about how they wrote, wrote really well um, and articulated their project so clearly about the importance of the heritage of Northwoods and the reality of what they live in actually today. And so off the back of that, the LA women are off to Kirby to see the full version of this show. And then um, they're having an archive session back at here together. And then we're playing the botcher game in the gallery to, to sign it all off. Um, so, so already there, there are becoming these kind of ties and connections and some of the members realise that actually they used to live in some of the different areas um, they sort of kind of all connect with each other and it's not to say that everyone's going to be this huge massive happy family but it's about how there's those potentials for, for conversations between the regions and the communities to talk to each other and in quite a lot of them particularly with, with Tony and the Northwood Women Project a lot of the topics that the women raised were very similar to the to the topics that the Windmill Hill women wanted to raise through their project, um, particularly about perceptions of kind of social mobility and, and kind of living the sub suburban glory life of the 1970s with the reality of actually what, what they live today. And so there's some real mm. crossovers and themes and almost it's through making the work that these commonalities allow those groups to feel comfortable to, to talk with each other because they're visually seeing connections that they might not have otherwise. So yes, there, there, there are things happening and we hope there will be more and that we hope that Open Eye becomes a sustainable space for them to do that. You know, ideally we'd love for the photographers to continue working with the groups, but some will stay, some will move on. And actually it's more about how, as commissioners, we become sustainable and um, responsible for, for long-lasting relationships because we understand that photographers will come and move and do new things mm -hmm. um, and it's not it's not our job to make them stuck in one place forever and <laughs> never do other projects um, but we are a base and, and that's our responsibility so yeah